Jen, I'm going to make you the spotlight. And I'm going to ask everybody to please mute yourself so that we are not, and that includes muting me because I'm a bit of a talker. All yours, Jen. What a lovely background. Welcome so much. Thank you so much. I really, I am so grateful to Malika and to Jennifer for having this reading and for inviting me. Um, as Malika was saying before, it's, it's just so generous of the, of the literary community at large and, and Jennifer in particular for inviting me and saying, I want to read. As I think a lot of us are finding out, um, but the wonderful thing that's coming out of it is that the literary community is really pulling together. Um, we have a, a great community down here in Miami, and I don't know where I'd be without my partners in crime at SWIM. And we published a lot of the people that I see coming on here in the audience, and I'm so grateful for all of you. It's just really nice to see the support. Um, and especially, you know, my, my fellow editors who I know are in the audience watching, and my family and my, my friends, and you know, my sister who the book is dedicated to, and my parents who I haven't seen in such a long time. This, this is a way for us to all connect, so I'm grateful. And I, I think I can say that my husband, who is my audience here, so he can stop me when I talk too much, um, he's probably seen too much of me. So <laughs> um, this book, and it's, this is actually the first time I'm reading from it, and I'm actually really happy that I sent it out last week. Um, I'll put it in the comments. The book is not actually for sale from the press yet, but I do have um, author copies that I sell at a discount. It's about a 40% discount. So I'll, I'll put that in the comments later. Um, this is the first time I'm actually reading from the book. And I was really surprised how quickly you got it, given all the problems with the post office. So those of you who have it, yay. Very happy to see that. The main themes in this book are family. Um, there's a lot of faith, a lot of questioning of faith, um, Judaism. There's a lot of feminism and social justice. And there is a lot of um, thinking about the kind of legacies that we are going to be leaving our children and the next generation and um, those who come after us. And if there's anything left to leave even, um, which is a big question right now in, in the face of all of the disasters, both natural and man-made that are happening. And I think this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. This book was about five years in the making and it, it really started <clears throat> with the passing of my brother which was a very tragic event for my family. Um, and a few books really came out of that. And the next one is going to be published by Salmon Poetry. Uh, Jen, you, you're muted. Jen, I think you got muted. Can you unmute yourself? I can unmute myself. Okay, so I'm not sure where I got muted. Um, but I will say that um, a lot of this book is rooted in childhood and has some memories of my brother. So I'm gonna start with one of those poems. And I have to apologize to my parents because I think a lot of the times they really didn't know what we were up to. And this, <laughs> so sorry, mom and dad, we did this. You might not wanna know about it. <clears throat> this is called Plexiglass Suburbia. And for those of you who want to know about such things, this is, um, this is a golden shovel. In the summertime, when the New Jersey humidity is so thick, it can be kneaded like dough. And there isn't much to do besides taunt and be taunted. Everything depends on making the Daredevil Club. Admittance is granted upon a feat of such physical audacity that even a Spartan even a boy like my brother cannot deny the legacy of red stippled scars it will surely leave behind. The wheelbarrow of flesh and courage that can be carted away in equal glazed measures from the site. My turn at the top of North Ashby with the neon orange skateboard no one knows how to ride in rain that has been falling for days collecting in the potholes. The water rubicund with clay from half-built housing developments beside our cul-de-sac. In my imagination, I crouch and glide, but in the end, I sit, knees to chest, 
and cast off, an unguided blur of white. It's no use. I arrive clean and whole to be cast down with chickens. And I think my sister would probably say that I don't, I don't, I didn't make the Daredevil Club, but she might have. Um, I'll have to ask her about that. So the next poem, um, my husband and I got married very young, I guess, according to the, to the logic of these days, we were both 24. And again, I, this one comes with an apology to my rabbi, um, because we had ideas then. We were just very much, we were young. <laughs> You'll hear those ideas in the poem. Um, but a lot of this book is also rooted in the natural disasters, like I said, and I really feel um, so, a lot of empathy for California right now. And the natural disasters that we go through in Miami are, of course, hurricanes. And this one has Hurricane Irma in it. This is called For Urgent Prayer, Please Plus One. Am I in need today? The Mercy Church robocaller from Marathon, epicenter, where Irma slammed trailers and cars from the narrow loaf of land into marinas like a waiter swiping crumbs from a table, wants me to admit it, to say, yes, I have no more strength except in this pointer finger to leave my print on the keypad and unlock the rest of this message. I could complain that I have run out of Diet Coke, that the mango trees have forgotten that they already stretch with the fetuses of fruit and bloom for the second time, throwing particles of pollen into the eyes of the wind that the old dogs can no longer sleep through the night and begin to whine at 3 a.m. That the pool has become a place for an iguana, the length of a crop bearing branch to garnish with salmonella. That this is the year my husband and I both turn new decades and still sink ankle shackled with debt. Or I could catalog our traumas, our long list of overripe injustices the ways our bodies bred Ashkenazi pure for so many centuries have been past broken genes, how we have rooted them in the Edenic soil, the kind that smells already like vegetables before you even plant anything of offspring. None of this is as exigent as weather turned into spirals as if on a child's etch-a-sketch, the rotting takedown, the invasion of biblical street rivers no prophets can split across. Afterward, the mosquitoes infused with infectious disease laying invisible eggs in the cupped puddles of downed leaves and fronds. The families homeless, even as another hurricane season approaches. No, Mercy Church, I am not compelled toward the singular digit. And it's not only a matter of the wrong programming of surnames. It's more like I require two for reluctant prayer or three for an indifferent utterance to add a nigh or even four so that I can unsubscribe from the service. Push five to opt out for the rest of my life. Six, if I am atheist, seven, agnostic. When my husband and I were engaged and meeting with the rabbi, we asked if he could replace the word God in the ceremony with energy. He ate for his reaction. Storms have mostly now to do with what we have done. How much worse they get depending on what or who we burn. Press nine for the inevitable, or if you insist, wait on the line for the operator. This might take a while. Thank you. So my husband loves that story about asking the, the rabbi to replace the word God in the ceremony with energy. I'll never forget the look on his face. He was not happy. Um, this next poem is another Irma poem, but um, my husband and I moved down to Miami right after we got married and it was just in time for Hurricane Andrew. And I think that gave me PTSD, um, but I, I'd like to look at it in terms of like, maybe it's an ancestral warning whenever these hurricanes come that are gonna be particularly bad because there's a feeling I get in the pit of my stomach and I feel like it's my ancestors telling me it's time to run. And I know my, my husband and my, my son who were there with Irma made a lot of fun of me because I wouldn't go to sleep without my rings on. Um, and this poem sort of alludes to that. It's also the title poem of the book. It's called Surge and Epigenesis. 
I have a terrific burning where my breath used to be. A blister of coal, I heave with energy on lockdown, ready to consume at any moment this voracious fuel. No one has to tell me when. In a single suitcase, my picked over clothes are sealed, documents evaporated to clouds like a reservoir in drought. Wedding diamonds threaded into crevices, only guards might think to search. I have known this rising for millennia. Awake, asleep, I yellow with it, turn sun. Thank you. It's so nice to see people clapping. It's, it's like reading to yourself, but you can see it. It's great. Um, one of the other themes that runs through the book is chronic illness. Um, I think this is something that runs through my family and many other families that we have a lot of, a lot of interesting illnesses. Um, but this poem was actually written about a friend of mine who has a lot of trouble with her eyes. It's called Vitreous. It's a sonnet. From eight until three, she teaches Shakespeare, half lit, her eye melting wax from the candle, the flame burning the whole of her pupil. Her vision is Morse code, spy code, a barcode, a bush of mosquitoes with Zika, sluggish, misted from too far with Nalid. A solilo soliloquy of flaws like Hamlet, the membrane chooses to be or not to be, detaches an arrow at a time, on pace, before the shafts laser back into its quiver, like crackers broken in packets, but still constrained by shape, leaded stained glass. Her eye is the poet, no one else sees the world around her fall into pieces. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read two more poems. This um, Last one from the book, and then a newer one. This one um, has a memory from my kids. I used to take them running with me in a double stroller, two, two babies in a double stroller, and they'd get antsy, so I'd throw little marshmallows at them, and they'd be quiet. I think they probably remember that. But I know they're both tuned in right now, not listening. So I'll tell them about, about this later. <laughs> This is called, If You See Something, Stay Camouflaged. Every day in the same crook of sapodilla tree, a weave of two acorn-rich squirrels who font each other's tails, matchstick ears free from mites. Down in my chair, I squirrel. I can only observe them if I pretend not to. Don't make eye contact through the spider-webbed screen, the impact window. What I've learned about not watching squirrels, they are also good at the gaze just beyond, like colleagues at a party who would rather not greet, or competitors at midfield forced to shake after the toss. These squirrels, as attenuated to threat, regardless of barriers, as migrants. Once, when running when I could still run, Achilles' tendons not yet knotted, like the chains of necklaces squirreled away in a bag together, under the double baby stroller on the root-cracked sidewalk, while I bounced in place for a stoplight to green. A gouache hunch of squirrel froze as if for an art student to sketch. I thought at first she mouthed a coconut, but it was a kit. Her jaws stretched so wide over the fuzz of her fruit-sized squirrel fallen from its nest, she appeared unhinged, the way we all must look when we sense danger to our offspring, but aren't quite sure if it is real, if we should act. Squirrely, I forwarded my babies through the sight lines of SUVs, heated breath at my hips, gunned into motion after discharge from aim. I was also that saw something squirrel. Thank you so much. This last poem I'm going to read um, is the first poem I wrote in my new house. We just moved. I keep saying we just moved, but it's been almost a year. I say that because we're still unpacking. I'm not very good at this moving thing. But this was the first poem I wrote in this house and surrounded by boxes and 
people installing curtains and doing things like that, but I'm writing a poem because that's what we do, right? We write. And um, it just won the Teferit um, poetry competition. So I feel totally vindicated for not unpacking. <laughs> and that's my excuse, honey, and I'll never take it back. This is called Berkat Habayi, A Woman is a Bird When. And it's also an acrostic poem after um, a painting by Tomas Valdiviso Vato, and that painting is called Empowered Women. So this is really about my empty nest. And yes, kids, I do miss you. A woman is a bird when, wood under feet, dressed in flower parts. She surveys her private garden, ragtag, but everything in it equal to her heart. Downsize, they tell her, it's only a start. Learn to bolster what's beginning to sag. Wood under feet, dressed in flower parts. A woman is a thorn, poisonous dart. Planes fly away from the kite of her back, everything in them equal to her heart. Convertibles accordion, roofs hard. Oh, to feel again the pain of the egg. Wood under feet, dressed in flower parts, a woman goes rogue, winging wide, apart. Her flock caught in a current of jet lag, everything in it equal to her heart. One eye doll wide, one squinting and alert. She talons her home like a prized handbag, wood under feet, dressed in flower parts, everything in it equal to her heart. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all. Oh, that was lovely. I know people want to unmute and clap. Please feel free to do so because uh, you know, Cindy just wrote the perfect thing. She said, you're a lovely poet, Jen. What a treat to hear your fine work. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was there were a ton of compliments in there. I, I just am amazed with your descriptions, how vivid, but how unique they are. Uh, somebody was writing how perfect your titles are. <laughs> it mm -hmm. really was just an honor. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I feel very, very <clears throat> overwhelmed to be here. So I, I really, I'm really grateful. I really am. Good. I hope you, uh, when we go, I'm going to, you know, have us move on to Jennifer, but people are writing all kinds of things in here that I really want to come back to Jen, um, especially the, you know, the compliments, the kite of her back. And there was one time where three poets, we all wrote the same line that struck us and <laughs> uh, when you hear it, you'll be like, that's it. I mean, at the same time, it was just absolutely perfect. Uh, her eye is the poet. <laughs> Three of us wrote that at the same time. So lovely. Just amazing. Thank you, Thank you very and much. I feel so honored that we were the first ones to celebrate this book with you. I mean, that is just amazing. It's all yeah. due to Jennifer. <laughs> oh, when Rhett just said, this is my introduction to your work, I felt, I feel like I just found a treasure. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. That is lovely. Thank you so much. All right, we will move uh, to Jennifer and then people don't forget to write your questions so that you don't forget them. Um, but I think this is probably the best way to, to do it. Um, Jennifer, can you say something and maybe I can find you that way? Yes, I'm right here. And Jen's reading was fantastic. And we should all clap again. Yes, I agree. That's Yay. awesome. <laughs> Did you find me? I did. You are oh. now the spotlight video and um, hopefully you can still see us too. Yeah, I there can. Thank you so much. If um, it's a little hard to hear at any point, would you just, you know, maybe give me a note? Cause I can see you in the side there. I'm like, okay. Okay, perfect. I will let you know. Thank uh, you. Cause we did have some instability. We did have some instability. So I'll try to let you know if, if we can't hear you for a moment. Okay, very Just good. Just a reminder, people to mute. Most people are doing a really good job, but there were a couple people that had to come back through. So I will mute myself and hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank so you so much. much. That was amazing. Thank you for, uh, you know, including Jen, because uh, obviously a lot of readers are like, yeah, Annie's doing thumbs up. And, you know, obviously for Rhett, she said, I feel like I found a treasure. So y'all have made our week.
Great That's job. so great. It, it's so much better to read with someone. And I feel like Jen's a friend. I've never met her in person, but I, I love her work. And so um, it just felt like this was the right thing to do. And this feels like a really special um, evening. So thank you so much for hosting us. Um, I'm so glad to be reading from my book, Fox Logic Fireweed. So both Jen and my book, they both came out on September 1st, and they're both our fourth books. And our names are both Jennifer. Uh, we probably grew up in the same generation. My middle name, which was my first name growing up, is Kohanic. I just feel like there's some interesting parallels um, and that it was right for us to read together. Um, of course, you know, you imagine it would be nice to travel for your book, but here we are um, with this incredible audience right here in our homes. And I'm so grateful that you all tuned in and that you're with us. It means um, so much. It's really a warm experience. So I'm going to read from um, all from Fox Logic Fireweed. Um, this book moves through five different terrains, flood, pl flood plain, coast, desert, um, mesa, and suburb. And sometimes these are physical spaces and sometimes they're more interior spaces. Um, and so there's also a lot of creatures in the book with their own creaturely logic. And right now, um, human logic is really hard to parse out. So I thought that the animal presence of the book might kind of help to steady us right now. So um, we have elephants, turkeys, bats, and spiders um, joining this reading. So I'm gonna start with a short, almost riddle of a poem um, called Preface, and it's about uh, the elephant. Preface. You could say, heavy as an elephant, but not to the elephant, whose thunder is a lean O as her speed makes a wind across the die-hard plain, and the flags of her ears undulate and slap like rockweed against the tide, but not to the rockweed, whose undulations depend on the long note of sleep that makes the sea, those flickering silhouettes, knee deep in moon shavings, who know nothing of elephants. This next poem is um, based on a question that my son asked me in the car when he was five. Poem for my son in the car. The wipers sweep two overlapping hills on the glass. We are quiet against the squeaky metronome as we often are before the concerns of the day well up. Today, is it dark inside my body? The wet cedars dark of green gone black, of damp earth mending itself. A pewter bell rung into night's collected sigh, coral and sleep sunk. Dark as the oysters clasp in its small mottled pocket and the word pocket, a tucked notion set aside in case of. Inside there are vestibules, clapboards, trapdoors, baskets, there is cargo. There is the self carrying the self, sprint, trodden, nowhere does it not, and mournful as a spine bowing to wood. You carry your actions, inside is cave and concern, everything purposeful, heartwood, clockwork, crank and tender, iron in the mountain belly, all the hidden things breathing. Outside of and woven into, you are the knowledge you can't touch, the desire you can't locate, unnameable questions, unnameable answers, source and tributary and the rivers that hold you beneath. Your darkness lives in that potential snow blind, aurora, pulse, shore. Thank you. <laughs> when the same son was two, he went through a stage where he was obsessed with really unusual musical instruments. 
And um, being the non-sleeper that he was, um, we'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and watch YouTube clips of alpenhorns, um, men playing alpenhorns on the Swiss Alps, hiking up there and assembling them on the top of these mountains. And something about it um, came to feel like home to me. Alpenhorn. Assemble the tree of it, peak side, blonde light against mutual whites of this winter altitude. If the mountain could play itself, if blue fog breathed inside alpine, the singular all of loneliness, calling buried stars, empty pockets out of its wood rich alpine womb. In the gloaming of the bone, blow the winding shallows home. I had never heard it, but when I heard it, one slope breath seeking, it was the fleet sound I came from, whatever pulse spun in me located, and I knew where to find my shadow among the shadows. So a while back, there was some really odd footage um, going around about this group, a very large group of turkeys processing in a circle in a um, Massachusetts cul-de-sac, I think, around a dead animal. I want to say it was a cat. Um, and we're so bad at grief in this country. And right now, there are almost 200,000 people who have lost to COVID that we haven't grieved properly for. Um, and the turkeys gently processing around this body seemed right to me. Um, so I wanted to read this tonight. What turkeys can teach us about grief in suburbia. That it moves in circles, that you don't need to be poised or eloquent, the pressure scouring you to orate by noon the true and succinct words. Vastly with all, then vastly alone, stuffed with food or void of it, the coffee too hot in the styrofoam cup, the coffee so cold in the night pot. The turkeys advise against polarity or wisdom. Walk with us, our upland kind. Study the loop of our walking under the crisscross wires, under the live oak and the story of its rustling to be swept in a quiet shape together around any small death, fender struck cat, being of our being, what fallen bird lit we never knew. We gather the pieces of each other and walk them round the cul-de-sac, one holding what the other cannot. The procession need not advance nor march toward any heavy door waiting to close. Let the ownership of grief be the shadow of a wheel and its moving parts. And if one sounds the rattling drum from the well, we bow our necks and sound the terrible beauty that weeps us. Body we knew, or body we could never understand, which once we heard yowling in the night, crouched and feline like a locked spring. We watched the magnificent creature leap toward the sound of its mouse trap throat and our hearts shuddered open in our baskety bodies. We watched the dark fur of it fly toward itself, claw thing, no wings anywhere. Limp dead street, the lights creaking on at dark. Round and round, oh moon, what are we to do? with all these feathers. I think when you have kids, um, you relearn things that of course you've known, but they just haven't quite struck you the way that they strike you again in this teaching to someone for the first time. Um, so the teaching in this poem being that bats are mammals. They are, they are of us. We are of each other. Um, and so um, in a way, this is a nursing poem um, and a bat poem and a, a meeting together. 
bat milk. They do, they do inside the living mountain where night is a constant, curl up like a god's shuttered eye and wait as I waited, body of my body, we sing the same blood warm song. Casements wrapped in ink, they are to themselves the center of the earth by which all things distinguish. Though still they may ask, as I have asked, staring across the battered plain, what monster, what monster am I? Midwife of shadow, the first milk breath hums in the mineral sky. So this poem is for the 850,000 Jennifers of the peak Jennifer era. Um, my, my trusty reading friend here, um, it's especially for her and any other Jennifers that are with us tonight. It's called Jennifers of the 1970s. We were part of a tribe, at least three to a class. You could scan a room and find us everywhere, swishing a hula hoop around our Jennifer hips. Enough of us to populate Fiji or Damascus, we orbited our own planet. The paisley atmosphere swelling as the bell bottoms tolled and the skyrockets took flight. Mirrored disco ball, each facet released another, known in relation to the initials of our last names, latch hooked on yarn pillows, ironed onto the back of our concert gut shirts. Macrame belt, God's eye, we came out of a dream sickle, rained like corn husk girls, easily wrapped into skirts at the church bazaar. Our decade was barefoot, tapestry, buttercup, lemon, lime, rick rack, easy cheese. To be so abundant, bearing a name that everyone agreed was lovely, a triple note they wanted to repeat, I stopped hearing it, the swift hook of the J, little gem in the mouth, the soft fur landing, all folded in the envelope of the common. A Xanadu of Jennifers, a roller rink of Jennifers, a decahedron of Jennifers. I could always see the collective of us, unwittingly part of the ensemble. Yet to be one meant we were also gifted an alter ego, a spray on leotard or chameleon foil lurking under our jumpers. I run into one of us now in yoga pants maybe a child at the hip. We're tired, we've seen some things, but we're pointed to the horizon. And sometimes a few of us still rise when the latte order is called and our gently wrinkling faces smile knowingly. Glitter wave we all came out of so decisively, we're the fossy dance in the musical that gets revived in summer community theater the cake still holding its layers in the rain, the silver moon boot that flares in the late October sky. I feel like it took me like 20 years to write a semi-funny poem. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, in what feels like a million years ago, um, my husband and I went to um, the Burning Man Festival many, many years ago. And uh, that's in Black Rock Desert, Nevada. And we were part of a group called Carousel Numinous. So we spent all year making um, a set of three different carousels that met together in the center and shot up in flames. <laughs> and each of the carousels um, had carriages with um, different painted deities and you pushed them and people got to ride around in the carousel. And so it would only work at night and it's too hot during the day. So my husband and I like to um, be, uh, take our carny stint in the middle of the night when um, things were kind of slow and, and quiet. So um, this is when we were carnies. 
We kept odd hours in the desert. Midnight when the heat lifted like a zeppelin, we bundled in layers and lit the lamp post. You oiled the hinges, anchored rebar with the heel of your work boot, while I swept sand from the love seats with a feather brush. We couldn't keep playa dust out of the phonograph, though we fashioned a small kite from a tent. Tom Waits, a grainy K Seurat, sent our message to the ether as we manually pushed the empty carousel, slow panels of night swinging in tilted circles. Keepers of the rust, the turning of peeled paint goddesses with their drastic faces. We took our guests' hands gingerly, tucked them into Shiva's bosom with army blankets and flasks of whiskey, gold teeth gleaming as we wheeled the ride forward. When it got up speed, you kissed me long and dizzy and the carousel unwound from its axis, spun out into the dark. We live right next to an orange grove and um, it's grafted onto the roots of wild lemons. And I wonder um, if Jen lives near an orange grove. I don't know if she does or not, but um, the presence of oranges and orange blossoms is just in our consciousness almost all the time. This is called Tinderbox. A grove of orange trees, fog and crow sky, ant trail leading in or out. We follow no path. Hold hands. You are just old enough for me to ask what you dreamt about when you laughed yourself awake and returned. Wake and turn, pull of the conscious, rowing you back too often, too soon. A little whale inside a tunnel, you said. We have learned night has eight keys and too many locks. You want to know if the palm branches are dead enough to pick up. You drag heavily behind, comb sand shorn lines. I am trying to feel what I will remember afterward, what you will not. How we touched the crowded leaf scars. Every tree's a living fossil. At two, I tell you everything, if not for knowledge, then the mystery of maiden hair, sleeping ginkgo, tinderbox. You are sweeping now. You are courteous with the dead lathe and rasp, last slake of ash in the hollowed rind. When you say it is amazing, I know it is amazing. Little bowls with their wet light. And I'm just gonna read one more. This is called Still Life with Djembe and Black Widow. Um, you probably know what a djembe is, but it's just an African shape. It's an African drum and it's kind of goblet shaped. It's a little tippy. Um, and I think that's it. I'm not gonna say anything more. <laughs> Still Life with Djembe and Black Widow. After the djembe fell on the baby, I exiled it behind the easy chair, as I did so many objects made newly hazardous. Every beyond and out of reach crevice, a still life for scissors, candlesticks, binder clips. I never learned to put anything properly away. After the djembe stopped presenting its call and response, some weeks passed. It could have been one or 50, I slept and did not sleep. The baby learned to walk, the brother to read. Soon the chairs were exiled to the garage. Anything that could be climbed, the baby wanted to hook the moon in the chandelier, could ladder a bookcase in under a minute. A living room is a diorama and a stashed black forest. Dormant, all the unsung cornered things I did not see balanced like rock sculptures. One hand lifted, I did not remember to beat against any hollow. 
a low-grade amnesia of hiding and forgetting. I was a thief and I was the thieved. Much of mothering is to focus in so myopically on keeping safe, lens that keeps clicking the eye closer until objects become furred and constellated in their own radical space systems. Solar me, there were no chairs anymore. We were spinning in the all day tumble of being in a body. And when I finally dragged it back out, the djembe skin was a dust layer I clapped, sounding us all into focus, a single base that drew us toward. And when we began again to feel the furred edge of its skin, the sleek unruly goblet of it, a network of cobwebs clarified under the binding, gazing in gauzy circles stretched across the void, a single base that drew forth a cluster of black widows dizzy across the floor. I pressed and brought to the door, finding here, then another. I had to see into their sleeping. I had to keep waking. Spider in the drum, spider in the drum, we chanted, which sounded like remembering, which sounded like falling. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jen and Malika, and all of you for being here. Thank you so much. And people can unmute. Oh, my heavens. But y'all have been amazing. Oh, and I can't believe y'all didn't know each other ahead of time because to me, y'all's work really works nicely together. I mean, they yeah. just dovetail. So that shocked me, Jennifer. I just assumed y'all were like best friends. <laughs> <laughs> On the page, I think we're all friends. We meet each and, other's work and feel such a nice connection, you know? True story, true story. And Jen did say she lived on a mango grove for 20 years. So That's amazing. not oranges, but mangoes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, now I, I was interested. In so I, plant, I planted lemons. We'll, we'll see. Oh, yeah. You planted the lemons. Well, I, you know, there's a ton of compliments and I just want to go back to um, some of what was said. And, and I just felt like there's so much synchronicity between y'all and the Jennifer poem was great. And that's not a partially funny poem. That's a full on funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There was a ton of people writing stuff with that one. Um, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to go back to what people were saying, but it was a hilarious. Um, Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't even know how to even start. This is a very busy chat section. So I'm going to have to send it to y'all so you can see it. Um, you know, Cindy was just writing amazing language and imagery. Uh, you and your Jennifer hips are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and let people, because I saw some questions in here and it might take me a minute to find it. So if you have one, please just unmute and go ahead and ask it. Yeah, see, John just said, both of you are such amazing poets. Um, thank you so very much. Loved all the poems and you both read amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was beautiful. I, I just was impressed with the deep empathy that you have, both of y'all, for the work that you're doing. And um, it was a similarity with like the reverence and like a deep questing. I really love the energy um, and how y'all's poems to me uh, really fit nicely together. Thank you. And somebody was writing amazing titles. And I know, I was like, I just want a list of the titles. We'll work from there. <laughs> All right, let me see. There was a question. And anybody can jump in if you'd like to. Let's see. How did we get the spiders out of the drum? Well, I didn't know that they were in the drum. So we started playing it. And that woke them up, and they all came out. <laughs> Oh, and then wow. I just kept bringing them, out, uh, crushing them, and bringing them outside, and bringing them, them out, uh, and bringing them outside. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do spiders. I can't no. do spiders. No. no. We did spiders. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the answer to that question was yikes. <laughs> yeah, evidently a lot of people wanted to know how those spiders came out. Yeah, you know, because that, that, Robbie wrote, "How did you get the spiders out? That's going to bother." Okay, nobody have any nightmares. I wanted to go back to, uh, Jen, there was one um, about the hurricanes where your description of post-traumatic stress, like the first couple of lines was so spot on. I thought, boy, that's one I want to write down 
um, just for what I'm working with uh, veterans because it just was so evocative and so very true. And I was hoping you could read them again. Um, is that the hurricane poem, Andrew, when y'all first moved to Florida about the ancestors and the warning? Uh, that's the, the title poem, the um, surge. Yeah. It could also be indigestion, if you think of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jen, number one, um, is, is your spider, yes, is your spidey sense uh, going off now that we have imminent Nazi takeover, uh, possibly? Like, yeah, mine too. Yeah. <laughs> But, and I keep telling my husband we need to buy gold and put it away so if we just leave, we can just throw it up into our hems. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> sew it up into our clothing. Like, what century do you live in? But, you know, just like Hey, you got to learn from this stuff. That's how we stayed alive that long. Yeah. Well, and Robbie, you talked about genetic memory. And, and we know That's that, true. you know, there are things passed down ancestral memories in, in DNA. So... I thought that really hit on that, Jen, lovely. Um, Marjorie wanted to hear the backstory of starting SWIM, and so does Rebecca. Oh, okay. Well, SWIM stands for Supporting Women Writers in Miami. Um, I started it with my good friend, Catherine Esposito Prescott. I don't know if she's still on, she might be. Um, we had gotten together a very long time ago when we were both like baby mamas and poets in a very masculine kind of atmosphere in Miami. We would get introduced at readings like, oh, here's a mother with a poem or just in a very dismissive kind of way. And we used to say things together like, we need to do something about this landscape where we're just getting dismissed all the time. And it took us about 10 years to get together and really say, now is the time. And it was probably because most of our kids have gotten older, although Catherine has a few years left to go, and I just got mine out of the house. Although they keep coming back. I don't know what that's all about. Um, but she has a, a, a minor, I now have an empty nest, so I can do a lot more. But our goal was to raise the literary landscape for women's voices and really raise it, not just say we're going to raise it, not just day we're going to give a reading and and then just cursory do it but to continue to do it and continue to support the women thereafter so we started with a reading series and deborah briggs from the betsy hotel who is a superior champion of the literary arts and also of women came on board almost immediately and said yes this is a fantastic idea let's do it and that rapidly turned into awesome. a magazine, which rapidly turned into hey let's publish a poem by a woman or a woman identifying poet every day. And then we brought on, within about a year, I guess, we needed more help. So we brought on our, our good friend, Caridad Moro Grandier, who also just published a book that, hey, you might wanna think about Maleka, it's called Grabbed. It's the anthology of um, poems about rape and um, assault. If you wanna Definitely. I'll, I may later, um, you can. reach out to you for that, but, you know, because as a former rape crisis counselor, I definitely am interested in supporting. Oh, it's a great anthology. It has tremendous poets in it. Um, but she did that with Richard Blanco, who, and a couple of other. Um, oh. So it's a really, really fantastic project. So the three of us have been since 2016 and 17 doing this project where we like to um, follow all the women we've published like little haunts and shout out their names if we possibly can. Sometimes we fall down on the job a little bit, but we try and get as many journals as we can. And I follow people on Facebook and I follow people on Twitter. And every time I see somebody I know, I just shout it out. So I have a regular schedule going on on Facebook where I can shout out people. And we've now published 650 women. Um, and yeah. we can them out. Amazing. 
Um, but that really is amazing. I mean, 650. And if you're not already getting swim daily, please reach out and do so. And the shout outs are incredible because you have an investment, Jen. Yes. And that's amazing. In four years, you know, the reading series is now, of course, online. We have to start that again online. But Swim Every Day is a poem a day by a woman or woman identifying. You can be non-binary. All right. Swim yeah. woman. You don't have to be as, you know, however you identify it's okay have a moment as a woman you qualify that's amazing it's fantastic so if you haven't been getting you know swim daily definitely um karen could you look that up and put that in the chat section for people just so that we don't miss that opportunity i feel like we need more reach and more we we definitely want more diversity um so and if anybody needs to like send us an email and say i can't afford the two dollar submission fee send us an email and we'll send you the free link because I know that's an obstacle to some people. Um, we only do that to cover our costs because of course it's all self-funded. Very hard to get funding, especially right now, but forever it's been very hard to get funding for a project that only supports women. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. Very no, that's funded. amazing. And thanks for that backstory. And thanks for that question. Um, there's a question for both Jen and Jennifer and just talking about, um, where do you find inspiration and who are your influences? This is questions from Laura. Jennifer, feel free. Okay. Um, where do I find inspiration? I mean, I think I just daily plug back into any experience of the natural world that I can find. Um, and sometimes that's a small moment. I mean, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be in a national forest alone having an epiphany, you know? I mean, sometimes literally you're really just picking up a stick in your yard and getting out of your head and just getting into like the, the material of the world. That's a, a home base for me always my whole life before I was a poet and it continues to be. Um, I was a dancer before I was a poet. And so that stick of that of feeling the body in the body um, is really always um, almost more tangibly felt than some of my other senses. So um, I, I, I feel a lot of and trust these kinds of feelings. I'm kind of an intuitive person and, and I sort of just trust that um, the kinesthetic sense will guide me because it usually ha does and has, um, which means I'm not an organized poet. I don't have a, a very like firm practice, but um, it, it's it's just an ongoing felt organic thing that that um, I think has always been a part of my life in one form of art or another, and um, both the natural world and just kind of being in the body and and being committed to, you know being grounded here, even when it's really difficult, is sort of my way in and my way out. Yeah, I wish I had just written down everything you just said. It's a good thing we're taping it because I have to go back to that. Oh. There was something very lovely, uh, and it doesn't surprise me because I was thinking about, you know, in your work, there's a lot of embodied felt kinetic energy. So that doesn't surprise me you're a dancer. That makes complete sense. Plus, there's a lot of rhythm and very uh, nice musicality. So I, I liked that. Thank you. Uh, I, Robbie said, why did you stop dancing? Um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm always dancing, you know, um, but formally dancing. Um, you know, got a little hard on, on my body to formally do it, but I love choreography and I love like just playing with movement. And so I feel like it's very natural now just to sort of slip into movement um, without, you know, saying I'm, you know, formally dancing. Um, it's still I, there. Yeah. Wow. Well, and you've channeled it into, because I felt like your pacing in poems kind of had a dance move to it, you know, that there's a more movement and then something slower. So I, I think that that's interesting. It kind of feels like it's channeled into your words too. I think um, when I'm writing, if I feel like I'm listening to something inside, then I know that I'm in. That's kind of my click moment. So Awesome. Well, I don't know how we got to eight o'clock. This is the fastest hour I think we've ever had. And, I, and there's something I really think is important to say. I know for reaching out to Jen, we can reach out to you via Facebook sure. for buying your book. Is that correct, Jen? Absolutely, and I'm gonna put my email um, okay. in the chat. 
and then, and then Jennifer, my book, yep. at any moment, but you know, it's, of course, it's a little difficult right now for the publishers, but um, please feel free to email me. I have plenty of author copies that I'll be selling. They're, they're going to be selling them at the press for $19 plus postage. I'm selling them for $60 with postage. So you'll save $6. Plus we get it signed. Bye -bye. Plus you get it signed. Yeah, no, that's awful, terrible, horrible handwriting. As anybody who has got a test. And you know, the background is somewhat, it is so lovely, Jen, behind you, the flower, how I didn't see that before, but now as the sky has darkened, it's perfect. It's lovely. Indias and some orchids, and I'll probably be the only one in the middle of winter sitting out here, and everybody else would be like, oh my God, they're just sitting outside. I can't stand her. Somebody slap her. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful yeah. outside. Yeah. My house is like a cement box with bad, bad Wi-Fi, so... I have to sit outside. Terrible, terrible, right? That. It's per I love that view outside. It's perfect. And, and my house is the same kind of way. It's a, a box where the internet doesn't work real well. And so for Jen, she put her email in there, make sure. Oh, and Andy said Jen's handwriting is totally legible. <laughs> you all gonna have to see for yourself. My handwriting is so bad. gotten worse, worse over the years. Oh, I have barely legible. Um, and Jennifer, do you have a preference through the publisher or can people have a signed copy via you? You certainly can, but I don't have very many left right now. I have to order some more. Um, so you could try to snag one of my last five copies and I'll send it to you on tomorrow. But um, otherwise, uh, probably going through the publisher would be the best way to do it. Yeah. Perfect. And just a reminder that we have the 40% off uh, uh, code in the chat section and I can put it down again since we've had this is the busiest chat section we've had so um, if somebody has a question that I missed but obviously we're not going to do open mic and guys I just uh, cannot thank you enough I, I love um, it was such an amazing night and I love that there's a sense of community and that both of y'all are deeply invested in um, reaching out to others and and uh, and that shows I think in how the spirit of this began. I think Jennifer immediately said let's add Jen and I can't imagine not having had y'all both together. Let me, mess, mess it. Let me get down to that. Great. Yeah, so I will send the chat section because y'all really do need to see what was written here. You really do. I could, <laughs> you know, spend the next 15 minutes reading compliments, but I'll send it to you so you can read it at your own, own time. Thank you, Malika. Can we all give a nice um, round of applause for our amazing host who sets up the warmest oh, reading? So you are so yeah. very kind. Thank oh, thank y'all. Yeah. Hey, kid, this is the highlight of my entire week. This is what I live for. I get to hear amazing poets. I, I just am deeply um, in awe of the work that y'all do. Thank you. Really am. Thank y'all so very much. All Thank right, guys, you. any last words? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. coming, everyone. I'm going to wave to all of you one at a time. <laughs> it's great to be here. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank, um, thank you. Well. Be well. Red, it's Red. good to see you. I see you there. <laughs> oh, Red, there Hi, you Jen. are. Thank you. Unmuting. Hey. Thank it's you. so good to see you. Hi, Steve. All right, guys. Thank I, you so much, I, I Jen, goodbyes. Jennifer. These goodbyes. Yeah, if I didn't already have so much fangirl, now it's gone to a whole nother level. I think I'm, like, you know. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. <laughs> I know. I just can't. I can't. I, can't. I, I seriously, you know, y'all had me tearing up and I never do that. I am like that. I was Jennifer deeply moved by your work. Thank it was you. awesome tonight. Yeah. Yeah, I can't even hang up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm doing it. I'm going to be talking about it <laughs> sometime soon. Awesome. Thank you. I'm Malika. Bye, Jen. Bye.